It is 7 p.m. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. And we are in the book of Revelation. Last week we uh, gave a really long introduction. Uh, pretty much the whole night. We did read the first four verses, but uh, we're going to go into them in more detail. We're going to go verses chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 tonight and really lay a foundation uh, on those and then move forward. Uh, one thing that I will be doing is, and I do this all the time when I study, I haven't done this with you guys, but that I many times do a parallel uh, and so I'm looking at NIV and King James Version at the same time. Uh, you can't read them at the same time, but they're side by side. Uh, so that is a study um, tool that you can use. Uh, there are Bibles that are sold that are that way. Uh, you can certainly do it online. Bible Gateway is an amazing tool, by the way, if you want to look at multiple versions and uh, multiple commentaries it's wonderful uh, Bible Gateway uh, another uh, source that I use is Blue Letter Bible if you really really want to dig into the original Greek or Hebrew text you can do that uh, not too many people do that I occasionally get really nerdy and dig way down deep and do that kind of thing but um, so anyway, I guess that's delayed whenever it's online. So let's look at this. Uh, Revelation, uh, this is lesson two, verses one through eight. I'm going to give just a little tiny recap of last week, just a few words. Uh, how many remembers the word apocalypse and what that means? It means unveiling. So it has to do with uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that is a comes from a Greek word, apocalypso, uh, and that's where we get the word apocalypse. And uh, so that's important to understand the five words that we talked about, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about. If you don't get anything else uh, in our study together, you got to get that. It's not about the signs of the times and the vials and the all of that, uh, those happen, but really what we're doing is getting an uh, in-depth, uh, up-close idea of who Jesus is and a greater revelation. So that's important for us to understand. Uh, another thing that we need to understand is that um, I've heard many, many people say, oh, I just get fearful or anxious whenever I study the book of Revelation. And I can tell you that God certainly did not intend that for us as Christians to get anxious or to get uh, fearful. And so uh, otherwise he would not have called the book Revelation. He would have called it mystery or, you know, apocalypse or, you know, something like that. So, um, so keep that in mind. Remember, it has many symbols in it, but it is not a symbolic book. In other words, it's literal. It mean, It will, the things that are to come will come to pass according to uh, the word of God. So, um, and we kind of talked about how the book is, of Revelation is an end cap to the Bible. Uh, takes us from beginning of Genesis all the way to Revelation. So it's important for us to understand that. And that this book contains doctrines. It's not just about end times, although that's the primary focus of it. Uh, there's doctrines, and we're going to actually see one of those doctrines tonight uh, when we look at this. So let's read. I'm going to read originally out of the NIV, and then we'll make some references over to the King James. By the way, does anybody here tonight have a parallel Bible with NIV and King James side by side? I do, but not with me. You, you do, but not with you. Okay. No, that's fine. I, I printed it out for me. I was just curious to see. So let's read that. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads it. I mean, remember this from last week. 
the one who reads it, who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. It certainly seems to be evident. Amen. <laughs> um, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. We're going to talk about that. The seven spirits before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and the Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And may God add a blessing uh, to the reading of this word tonight. So when we begin to look at this, of course, verse 1 is the subject of the book. It's Christ. Uh, and as you advance through the book, you learn, you're going to learn greater things, not only about Jesus Christ, but about the Holy Spirit and about God the Father. So you, we're going to learn more about God uh, and the Trinity. So uh, God gave uh, John this revelation. Really, honestly, he gave the revelation to Jesus who gave it to John, right? Uh, so uh, John was to deliver the message to seven churches uh, and the angel of each church. Now, I'm can I tell you, I'm not used to being referred to as an angel of the church. That was the way they used to refer to uh, pastors and priests of church, of churches. And so all that word really means is the messenger of the church. And so that's, that's a reference to that. So when this book goes into that, uh, the pastor is simply a messenger for the church. They are to reveal deeper and deeper revelation of Jesus Christ. So you're going to see that in this book uh, when he's talking to the angel of the churches because that's going to come in chapter 2 and 3. Uh, so we're going to see that word used. So the book of Revelation or prophecy in general is primarily for the church. That is on your questions there. So, and it's secondarily for the world. So this book was written for us. That's why we get first mentioned. We're the first group to be talked about. The church. So it's primarily for the church. And then secondarily uh, for the world. As, as, as we look at that. And then uh, as we get into chapters 6 through 19. We're going to see uh, that that's when the seals are going to be broken. The vials are going to be opened. All of that. Uh, we're going to see that it's talking about Israel in that uh, particular uh, set of chapters, chapters 6 through 19. So, do you remember from last week, what three groups was this book written to? I just told you two of them. It was written to the church, it was written to Israel, and it was written to who? The Israel, yeah, the Jews, Israel in particular, and the nations. Okay, the nations are mentioned in chapter twenty-one and twenty-two. So, uh, so anyway, when we get to that, so chapters six through nineteen, and I'm giving you a little heads up, and then we're going to talk about those verses one through eight in particular. Um, these are about Israel, chapters six through nineteen. Anybody in here know when Israel became a nation again? 1948. 1948. Say it again. May 23rd, 1948 uh, is when they became uh, a nation again. Uh, prior to that, they had no place, no land. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were 
dispossessed of their of their land. So now, um, now revelation can literally take place. The things that are to come, because God deals with with Israel as a nation, right? And so that's that's able to happen. God's poised to deliver or to deal with the nation of Israel. So look at verse one. Verse one. Let's do a little bit of study back and forth between the two versions there. And by the way, that's why you have versions. How many knows that people see different things in the Bible, right? Uh, we, we, different things are highlighted depending upon what you saw, depending upon your background, all those kinds of things. Uh, people see different things. And by the way, when you're reading Greek and Hebrew, oh my goodness, have anybody ever looked up just one single word? in the Greek, and it'll have a page of comments about what it means. So that is the reason why you have so many different versions, and people look at it and say, it means this. No, it means this. Uh, so uh, I like both of these two. They're not the only two I study with, uh, but I do like them, and they're pretty close uh, to what I think it ought to say. But then again, that would be the Brian Roberts version and I haven't written one of those and I don't intend to. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so when we look at that, it says, he made it known to them. The NIV says uh, in verse 1, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place and he made it known uh, by sending his angel to the servant. So he says he made it known to them. And then the King James, it says what? What does it say? It says, signified it by his angels. He sent and signified, which is a little bit different word. You guys got pens and paper on you? Write this word. S-I-G-N and then put a dash. And then write I F I E D. Right? Sign, S I G N. Then put a dash and write, write I F I E D. He signified it. What did we say the Bible here in Revelation is filled with? Signs, right? So that's the reason why King James is one of the reasons why they will use that particular wording. Does it mean basically the same thing? He made it known to them. He signified it. In other words, uh, NIV is correct, but so is King James. But King James makes it more understandable, in my opinion. Right? So he gave all these examples that he's, uh, and illustrations and signs and symbols. And that's the way it's interpreted there. Uh, Signs and symbols, as we talked about last week, can be a little bit confusing or misunderstood, but that's because we're not Jewish, right? And so it's important for us uh, to see that. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, uh, who, in the, King, in the NIV, who testifies to everything that he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the King James, it says... He did what? He bore or bare record of the Word of God. So, NIV testified. King James, he bore record of it. What's the difference there? Why is, why is one saying one and one the other? Uh, the King James, how many, let me ever read the King James and count how many times that it says something. I don't do that. I let Bible Gateway do that for me, by the way. <laughs> so if you search for a word, it will tell you how many times in the Bible it is. But throughout the Bible, for instance, Micah 1.1, 1, 1, it says the word of the Lord came to who? To Micah. Joel 1.1 1, 1 says the word of the Lord came to Joel. Hosea 1.1 1, 1 says the word of the Lord came to Joel. Hosea says the word of the Lord came to Hosea. So what is this telling us? Why is it so important? Was it wasn't John's opinion. It was... uh, exactly. Say it again. It wasn't John's opinion. It wasn't John's opinion. It was transposed or translated or told or there was a record that was bore to John 
uh, and it wasn't his own thinking or opinion. So that's why it's important uh, for us to understand this, is that this has been uh, revealed to John. It's, been, it's a transmission of the word uh, to John. It's the, in other words, the way the NIV says, it, it's a testimony of who Jesus is. Uh, and it's interesting. When you look at Jesus when he was on the earth and he was with his disciples, if you were to guess who Jesus' favorite disciple was, who would you say it was? John. John, right? John. He was the beloved one. The one that Jesus, I mean, it literally says, John says that of himself, the one that Jesus loved, right? Now, that's pretty bold for John to say that. But when we begin to look at this, it's interesting. The one that probably knew Jesus best of all, God gave an even deeper revelation to him. And so that's, to me, just kind of neat. Just thinking, like, John, you thought you knew who you're dealing with here. But let me give you some deeper revelation. But isn't that true that what, when the Lord gives us something, if we are faithful in it, does the Bible tell us? It'll give us more, right? And so that comes, that's also in revelation. So if we're faithful to dig and to study and to uh, read the Word of God, then He's going to bless us. So, uh, John walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, and now he is in, uh, he is going to get a deeper revelation through the Spirit. He's the, he is the only one that died an old man. Ever? I think, I think the records say he was probably around 89 to 90 years old. So, he outlasted all the other disciples for sure, all the other apostles. Uh, look at verse 3. Now, we don't have to go back and forth between NIV and uh, King James now, but we read this last week, but I want to point out something, and it may, to you, may not seem like it's that big of a deal, but I believe it is. Blessed is the one who reads, the one, uh, allowed the words of the prophecy, blessed are those who hear and take to heart what is written. So, all of those words are what? Present tense. In other words, it's not saying blessed are those who used to read. Blessed are those who used to hear and those who used to do the word. But it is a present tense blessing. It is the threefold blessing of God. And we need to keep doing those things, right? We need to keep hearing and reading aloud. Did you notice the NIV says reading aloud? Do you ever do that? Yeah. It's powerful, isn't it? Uh, you know, sometimes we get in the habit, because maybe we might disturb somebody, but reading under our breath or just, just, you know, in our mind. But it's very powerful to read the Word of God out loud. There's just something about it, right? Uh, it seems like it just sinks in deeper. Anybody ever had that experience when you read it out loud? So... Uh, it's very important uh, to do that. They're all present tense. That's in your questions, I think. Uh, why is that? Because the time is near at hand. Right? It's not past tense. It's near at hand. Kentucky vernacular would say it's right around the corner. <laughs> I had a... This is a side note. I had a... I, when I was literally growing up in Sylvania because I started working there when I was 20. Uh, and I worked in the shipping department for a long time. There was an old man in there who was a supervisor and he wasn't the main boss, but he was a supervisor. And I'm not going to say his name because this is going live and some people in here probably would know who I'm talking about. Uh, but he used to call up the, the people that the shipment was going to and it didn't matter if it had just backed out of the dock or if it was three states away, he'd say, it's right around the corner. It's right around the corner. So that's why I say Kentucky vernacular would be, it's right around the corner, right? Uh, that this is about to happen, things that are about to happen. Uh, so 
This book is written to seven churches. We went into that last week. But I want to say just a little bit more about these uh, seven churches. So they're real, literal churches. And um, we have to look at them in three different ways. We have to look at them historically. Okay? Uh, that might be on your questions. I can't remember. Uh, we have to look at them historically because they were literal churches who were going through some of these issues and being ministered to at that time. So historically speaking, these are real literal churches and they're being ministered to and talked to by the Lord through John, right? Uh, the second thing that we have to look at them is they are representative. What I mean by that? They represent churches down through the ages. I mean, it was the Bible was just like that, right? What we read today can apply to us and we can, it can have meaning and depth to us just like it did 2,000 years ago, right? Uh, so these seven churches, it's representative. In other words, uh, they represent different time spans, different uh, uh, periods uh, in the church, in church history. And so, uh, but they also can represent different churches. So there may be a church, whether it be being multiple churches modern day, and Laodicea might fit one church, and Philadelphia may fit another church. So it is representative both historically and modern day. All right? It's important for us to understand because that tells us we need to study about these churches. And... Um, and also that it's historical. And then lastly, of course, it's also prophetic. We have to look at them prophetically. So they're going to tell us something about the future uh, as we study them. So it's important for us to look at it that way. Uh, and this was from verse 4 from him who was, who, who is, who was, and who is to come. He didn't just exist at the time he was born. Isn't that hard for us to understand? When we look at Jesus, he was alive before he was born. And after he died, he was still alive. It's hard for our brains to get around, right? I mean, that's the nature. He was, he is, and he is to come. And many times, you know, we'll draw uh, hope from historically what God's done from us for us uh, for the present or, or maybe you know uh, in the present we're looking forward to the future knowing that God's going to do something so it is uh, it, that's the nature of God so it's telling us what is that doing it's revealing our, uh, the nature of Jesus Christ that he is is was and is to come so uh, that tells us something about it. all right when we look at this, so God is not, and neither is the Lord, subject to time. That, that should blow your mind. Do you know anything that is not subject to time? Have you ever seen anything that's not subject to time other than the Lord, right? I mean, we, everything we do is about time. When we get up in the morning, uh, it might be because we set the alarm. Right? Or it might be because our bodies have gotten used to getting up at the same time every day. Um, so we all deal with time. So uh, the Lord is not confined to time. He's past, present, and future. And uh, so as we see that, that's a, the, one of the natures or the revelations of who Jesus is. So who is this book from? You know who it's to? Who's it from? It's from God. Look at verse, I think that's verse 4. Yeah, verse 4. John. It's from grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. So that's from the Lord, right? And then it says, and from the seven spirits before his throne. What does that mean? What do the seven spirits before the throne of God mean? Anybody have an idea? Is it literal? 
Let me ask you a question. Are there seven Holy Spirits? No, right? There's one. So when we look at this, this, this kind of helps us to understand many times we have to look at things literally or we have to look at things uh, uh, knowing something about the nature of God. So what is the number seven in God's terms? Completion. What did you say? Perfection. Maturity. So when we see that it is from the seven spirits, uh, there's not seven spirits before the throne of God. This is a figurative in that uh, it's God's perfect number. It represents the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the completion and the perfection. Uh, how many knows the work of the Holy Spirit is perfect, right? Now you may have you may read some other things and say that this this is what this is talking about, but uh, it's one way that we have to look at this is it's about the completion of the Holy Spirit. So it's from the Lord this book is, and from the Holy Spirit, right? And so uh, it's one way for us to look at that. Look at verse five. Now, this is what we're really going to learn a lot throughout this book. Are the titles and the names and what that means of Jesus. There's three titles mentioned there. What are they? Faithful witness. Faithful witness. Firstborn of the dead. Firstborn of the dead. What else? Ruler of the kings of the earth. Ruler of the kings of the earth. So there's three titles here in verse 5 uh, that tells us from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. The firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So when we look at this, uh, they're deeper revelations of who Jesus is. So why would he be referred to as a faithful witness? Any, any, any ideas? Why would, why would Jesus be considered a faithful witness? He came on behalf of the Father. So he's... A witness to what? To all, right? Yeah, creation to all of to himself, uh, and and literally the Bible does tell us that the witness for him is the Father and him. So uh, he is the faithful witness. Philip's not here, and I, last time I taught this, I don't actually remember uh, asking him. I said. You know, when you're in a trial, you have what? You have people who are witnesses to what has happened, right? And it's not a good trial if you don't have a witness, because otherwise it's what? Hearsay. Hearsay. So Jesus is the faithful witness. If he is the witness, and this is a trial situation, in other words, uh, God is judging, that's part of what the book of Revelation is about, then who's on trial? <laughs> the churches, right? The churches are on trial, especially in this first section, right? Yeah. Because he's going against us. That's exactly right. Uh, so uh, the devil is going against us is what she said. That's, uh, that's why he gets cast out. So the churches, when we begin to look at churches, I don't want to go too much into this. The churches mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and 3, when you read those, you're going to find out that the Lord says something good about them and something not so good about them, right? So he's a faithful witness. He just doesn't say something that makes you feel comfortable and good about everything, right? And he tells you how to fix it. So, and we're not going to go into that tonight, but uh, so if Jesus is a faithful witness, he is the firstborn uh, of the dead. Well, let, let me say one thing. Uh, this faithful witness is also a reference. So you have some double references going on here. Uh, so the faithful witness is also a reference to uh, the prophet role of Jesus. So Jesus was faithful. <laughs> it's hard to say this because he is the word. But he was faithful to bring the word and to teach the word and do what God called him to do. So he has a prophet nature about him, right? 
So he is faithful witness, and secondarily, you can look at that as he is a prophet. And that is in your questions, but they're on two different lines. Uh, so he's a witness to God's word. In John 18, 37, it says, You are a king. This is Pilate talking to Jesus. You are a king, then said Pilate, and Jesus answered, For this cause I came to the world to testify the truth. So this goes about him being a faithful witness. John 8, 18 says, I am one who testifies of myself. That's what Jesus said, right? Now, does the courthouse let you testify about yourself? I mean, they're going to ask you questions, but are they going to take your testimony by itself as valid? But Jesus is saying here, I testify of myself, but also later on it says that my father uh, is another witness. So uh, we have to, uh, the role of the, of the faithful witness. So move on. Firstborn from the dead. When you look at this, you may say, well, Lazarus died. And he did. And Jesus raised him back from the dead. But the firstborn of the dead has reference to that Jesus is the only one who ever lived and died and lived again. And never died. Ever. After that, right? Uh, so he is the firstborn uh, of the dead. That's what Jesus is. Uh, He's never died uh, since being raised from the dead by the Lord. Uh, Jesus died. He was resurrected. And then the Bible tells us that he did something very interesting. When Jesus died and Mary was there to greet him, what did he tell her? He said, don't touch me because what? Because I'm not gone to the Father, right? In uh, the book of, uh, I believe it's, I was going to write that down. Hebrews, I think, chapter 9, verse 12. It tells us that Jesus went to the heavenly tabernacle and he spread his blood upon, or sprinkled his blood upon uh, the uh, mercy seat there. So when we look at this, he is the firstborn from the dead, but yet he also is serving as a priest. So he has been, in this we've looked and we've said he's a faithful witness, which is also reference to a prophet. He is uh, the firstborn from the dead, but yet also he is a priest. In the Old Testament, the priests were the one who went in and sprinkled blood on the mercy seat, right? And so uh, you see a couple different things going on. You see uh, Jesus being referenced in literally six different ways and the roles that he uh, uh, the roles or the positions or however you want to say that that Jesus says. I hope I'm not confusing you here. But uh, so when we look at Jesus, the interesting thing about him being the priest is not only was he the priest but he was also the sacrifice. Right? The perfect sacrifice. Don't need another one. The uh, priest uh, before Jesus had to offer sacrifices daily. Right? And they offered sacrifice. Here's the difference too. That when they offered sacrifices, they offered them for their sins as well as for the sins of the people. Jesus didn't sin, so he offered a one-time sacrifice for the whole world. Right? So here's here's I know I've got some questions on this. So you got uh, you got faithful witness and you've got uh, firstborn of the dead, and then the last one is the ruler of the kings of the earth. But then you also have prophet and priest, and we're going to talk about the next one here in just a minute. But you can probably guess what that other role is. Prophet and priest. So he's the ruler of the kings of the earth, it says. So God makes him ruler over all because he was faithful to do what God called him to do, right? The Bible tells us that he has made, uh, that God has made the name of Jesus higher than any other, right? Uh, and so uh, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, God put him over everything. And the scripture uh, 
tells us that, that he is over everything. But what does the scripture also say about us? Co-heirs. Exactly. So, if Jesus has been made over everything, and we're co-heirs, that means he paid the price for everything, and we get the benefit. Isn't that pretty good? That's kind of like somebody going out here and buying insurance, and I get the benefits of it. Right? Uh, so we are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus paid the price that you and I get the benefits of being an heir. The other thing is we didn't earn it. Right? The only way we have those benefits that Jesus uh, gave to us is not because we worked hard. I mean, we can never work hard enough. Right? Uh, but because of the grace of God. What does, uh, in Genesis, what does the Bible tell us that we were made like? I'm, drive, I'm driving home a point, right? We're made in the image of God, is what Linda said. So if we're made in His likeness, and He is the King of kings, I mean, those in the Bible, we're also called kings and priests, right? Uh, I'm not saying that we ought to think of ourselves more highly than we should, but what I want us to see tonight is Jesus paid the price for all of that. And so that's a new revelation. It may not be new to you, but that's what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation is that uh, Jesus is the ruler of the king of all the kings. That means he is the king of kings, right? And so, uh, and then the cool thing is we're going to rule and reign with the king. Okay? That's what Revelation tells us. Uh, so, you see those titles of prophet, priest, and then finally king. Going hand in hand with this Revelation. Uh, I don't know if I want to go into that or not. Let me just, just say this. In the Bible, when prophets were speaking to Israel or to some nation. I mean, it was that a prophet doesn't usually just come and say, this is what's going to happen to you. But what he usually does is he comes and he brings the word of, of the word of the Lord to a people or a group or a nation. And he says, this is what's going to happen. But if you turn back to God, or if you do not turn back, God, then this is what's going to happen. So the role of a prophet is to uh, bring the message of God, but also to give people a warning and a second chance. I'm so glad we get a second chance, right? Uh, and that's what uh, Jesus' role as a prophet is, uh, helps us and benefits us. Uh, so when we begin to look at chapter 6 through 19, uh, in chapter 6, there's a question in heaven. Did you, did you know that there's, no, that there's a question in heaven? In chapter 6. It says. Who is worthy. To open the book. Who is worthy to open the seals. Right. Well what's the answer? Jesus. Jesus is right. Why is he worthy to open it? Because of. He's the prophet and the priest and the king, right? Uh, he's worthy to open the book and the seals. Uh, he's the firstborn from the dead. He's paid the price for us. He shed his blood. So none of us are worthy. No one. Huh? He's spotless and blameless. He's the sacrifice and the priest and the prophet and the king and the, you know, all of this. So he is the one who is worthy to open the seals. And we're going to see that when we get there. Uh, but I want to uh, let you know about that. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. Count it together. I read verse 5. Let's read verse 6. And has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. So all that I said about the Lord, he's made us a kingdom and a priest to serve the Lord. Not so that we're lifted up, but in our role as uh, priests 
we are to serve the Lord, right? So you, you're looking at a whole room full of priests of the Lord, right? Uh, and we don't think about ourselves that way. We only, we only think about the priest or the pastor being the one who gets up in front of everybody and preaches on Sunday morning. But we're all kings and priests. We're a part of what uh, the royalty of God, uh, not because of what we've done, right? But because of what Jesus has done. So when we look at this, look at verse 5. At the end of verse 5 it says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve the Lord. So uh, the first thing we see is that Jesus loves us. So all these are and they may, it may not be new to you, but fresh revelation that Jesus loves you. Aren't you glad you know that? And the Bible confirms it here in Revelation. That Jesus loves us. To him who loved us. But it goes further. Who freed us from our sins and who washes away our sin by his blood. So when we begin to look at this. It's his love for us that drives him to shed, to allow his blood to be shed uh, and to cost him his life. What is that? That's the gospel. That's the doctrine of salvation. All right here in one verse. Right? Jesus died for you and me. He paid the price. Thank God because we couldn't. Right? So that's the doctrine of salvation. Uh, and, and we're glad that the Lord loves us and we don't have to pay that price for ourselves because we couldn't do it. Look at verse 7. Look, he is coming with clouds. What does that sound like to you? He's coming out of the heavens. What's the reference to? Because many times we get this wrong. That's why I'm saying it. We look at this and we think it's talking about the church. It's coming in clouds. But it's not talking about the rapture. It's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Which is different than the rapture. How do we know that? Yeah. Exactly. So let me draw some parallels. You all help me. So second coming of Christ. And Kay just said this. Everybody's going to see He's going to come down and he's going to set up a kingdom and he's going to all these, you know, all these things that there's going to be a millennial reign, all of this. That's the second coming. What's the rapture look like? We meet him in the clouds. Does everybody see? Him? Is it heralded that he's coming? It's like what? Twinkling of an eye. Twinkling of an eye happens like that. What else? Tell me. The trumpet sounds, we rise, what else? Didn't Christ rise first? And did we, right? And and is it, you said it's not announced, but is it secreted? Yes and no. It is, it is secretive if you're on the wrong side of it. Because the Bible tells us that we can see the signs of his return. But it also tells us that he will come like what? A thief in the night. Right? Does the thief call you up and say, make sure you got every, all your good possessions out so that I can come at 11.55 and, and steal them? He doesn't do that, right? Neither, you know, neither does Jesus rap. The rapture happen like that. So... Uh, while we can see the signs, the Bible even says that no man knows the hour, not even Jesus knows the time, because it's his Father yeah. who will tell him, go get your bride. Mm -hmm. Right? So in, in, isn't that really cool? So here we're seeing, uh, this is talking about the millennial, the second coming. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the rapture when we get to that point. This is not the rapture, but it's good. You guys are smart. You know, uh, you're able to tell me things about uh, the two different, uh, uh, the rapture and the, and the coming of the Lord. So 
No man knows the hour or the day. Uh, let me see if I put anything else in here. The rapture is a signless and a timeless event. In other words, there's not going to be some big, you know, the clouds roll back and we see the Lord. The rapture. Not so with the second coming. How? Let me just ask you a question that I don't know if you got an answer to, but maybe you do. You might be right and we'll all know when it happens. How is everybody going to see the Lord come at His second coming? Huh? Because <laughs> he's omnipresent. That's a good answer. Yes. So, so there's an omnipresence of the Lord, but there's also a manifest presence of the Lord, which means He's right here, but He's also right here, right? Uh, but how would we? Any ideas? How would the whole world, not just us, see the second coming of the Lord? You're probably talking about all of the uh, television and all that we have. There you but, go. But I believe I'm going to see the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see with it. You're coming back with it, right? What really is a flat Huh? What really is a flat earth? <laughs> really is a flat earth. No, it is not a flat earth. Uh, <laughs> but... I, I think we could be multitudes of things. I mean, we have televisions right now. I mean, this was, oh goodness, I left Sylvania in 2013. And when I left, we had had the technology for probably seven or eight years to be able to turn on the television and to be able to see somebody sitting in a conference room states away and we had a conversation. We didn't just hear them, we saw them, right? And so the technology has been here, uh, but maybe the Lord has a new one, right? But I believe the Lord's going to have his own technology. I don't think he has to use our technology. <laughs> I would agree you with know, you. I, I see that now this is going to sound crazy, mm -hmm. but if God is with me over there and he's with you over there and we both know him, I think when he comes, every. He's, his, and his presence is going to be in front of every single person. Right. right. And that's how they're going to see. So is, it probably goes into the nature of his, of who he is. Yeah. But he could use technology. But he Ever probably won't. He probably has his own. <laughs> um, everybody is. Yeah. I think Everybody's going to see. People will actually see him face to face. Face to face. It won't. I don't. Yeah. I agree with that. So. When the Bible talks about the rapture, it talks about people walking side by side and one of them's gone, another's left. When it talks about the signs pointing to the second coming, uh, it's talking about him coming in the clouds, everybody beholding him, and uh, Except for us who have the whole horses, right? Kay, Kay's all excited about getting a horse, riding on the white horse, right? Uh, <laughs> well, he'll give you a good one, a good horse. Uh, <laughs> so, every eye will behold him. In other words, he'll transcend geographical limita limitations. Can we... We can't with just our natural eyes see people on the other side of the world, but he's going to transcend all of that, all of the geographical uh, limitations. Um, you know, you said a while ago that, that, that the rapture will not be broadcast, but I I have a feeling it's going to be very broadcast when people do after the aftermath of it. <laughs> yes, not the event. Not the event. I know the right. Yeah. The there'll be no predi there'll be no uh, cameras pointed at the sky, in my opinion. Nobody's uh, right. <laughs> right. Right. And we, as Kay said, there is no, there are no signs, no prophecies that have to be fulfilled, in my opinion, before the return of the Lord. 
So it could be before I finish the sentence, before we finish the Bible study. You know, even so, yes, come Lord quickly. Well, I think that's one of those places where it, in, in, instead of him using technology, he will shut down technology. Oh, he may very well. I think that that's one of those, I mean, door cameras and all that that, that show all this stuff now, they'll be dead in a doornail when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Uh, I'm not saying the way that I am. The Bible even says in this verse, verse 7, it's kind of what we've been looking at, even those who pierced him will see it too. Who's that? The Jews, right? Now, the Romans soldiers did it, but the Jews are what caused it to happen. This is a reference to, because this is also a book to Israel, right? Uh, so it's a reference that they will see him. I believe that it is, well, even before that, but they will know for sure that they the Messiah has come before and now they're beholding him again. So uh, they're going to see him. Verse 8, we'll finish up with this and uh, we'll go a little further next week. We're going to look at the questions. Uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. What does Alpha and Omega mean? Beginning and end, first and last. It is also the Greek letters of the alphabet, which are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So he is preeminent. He is the first and last. Uh, he is not bound by time, as we talked about at the beginning. Uh, and then it says he is the Almighty. That is a reference uh, to the Lord as being over everything. And kind of said that earlier in, the, in this chapter as well. In the book of Revelation, it refers to him as the Almighty eight times. Eight times. So there's a... I, 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 look, I actually did, I got real nerdy and I said, how many times does it say the Almighty? You know, look it up in Bible Gateway. The Almighty. Click. 45 times in the Bible. Eight of those are in the book of Revelation. Right? So he's over everything. That's good news. That's really good news to end the Bible study with tonight. That no matter what is going on, the Lord is almighty. Not some stinking virus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Uh, God is the almighty. The Lord is the almighty. All right. Um, let's quickly go through the questions. I've got to do this quickly because I took too long with that. Revelation is primarily for what? Church. For the church. Secondarily for who? The world. the world. The book of Revelation was written for three different groups. What are they then? Church. church Israel, nations. Israel. The nations. The three throne blessings are all what? Present tense. I really want you to get that. That means keep doing it. And God's going to bless you now, not just later and not just before, but now, right? Question four. The seven churches can be interpreted in three different ways. Historically, Historically representatively, representatively, and prophetic. prophetically. Yeah. What three titles are given to Jesus in verse five? Faithful, Faithful witness, witness firstborn of the dead, ruler, ruler of the kings of the earth. Right? And these titles can also be referenced as prophet, prophet priest. priest, and king. Right? Uh, verse 7 is not about the rapture. It is about the second coming of Jesus. And blank and blank means first and last. Alpha and O.